like to um, introduce Marjorie Winters from Roaring Brook. She is a member of the Land Trust, the Wetlands. Inland Wetlands. Inland Wetlands. Conservation Commission. And the Simsbury Garden Club. And she's here to speak to us about changing land and changing animals. Lovely. All right. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I forgot to ask, can we turn down the lights or oh, is, it, yes. is that going to affect anything there? Kristen, you can see it. No, okay. we just see yeah, it. So, thank you for coming out tonight. It's a pleasure being here. Um, how many of you have lived in Simsbury all your life? <laughs> Excellent. All right, how many of you are newcomers who have only lived here like 30 years or so? Yeah. <laughs> and some early. <laughs> I know, I'm, I moved here in 86, so I'm still young, you know, new, new to the area. Um, but there ha I know there have been a lot of changes since I came to Simsbury. Of course, once, once you move to Simsbury, you say it's got to stay that way. We don't want any changes. Um, change is hard. Um, but there are a lot of changes that have happened in Simsbury. And one of the things that I've enjoyed working at Roaring Brook Nature Center is learning about the changes that have happened to the land before I got here and um, certainly I've been aware of some of the changes that have happened since. So we're going to talk about that. I've got lots of pictures to show you. Um, so we'll, we'll just get started. Here we are in Simsbury, 250 million years ago. <laughs> a lot of changes since then. It was a semi-tropical place. Yes, you can tell by the lovely red mud. And the Rutiodon, which was a, um, a crocodile-like creature that was found as fossils in the Simsbury area. I think that's amazing. Well, let's, let's bring it up a little closer. 185 million years ago, I'm not going to go through all the millions of years, but 185 million years ago, if you've been down to Rocky, um, Rocky Hill, uh, Hill State Park, Dinosaur State Park, um, you will see these wonderful footprints that were left behind in the mud uh, um, uh, 800, uh, 185 million years ago, and they were left by, um, these are our state fossils, they, they were called Eubrontes, the fossils are called Eubrontes, we really don't know what kind of dinosaur made it, but it might have looked something like that, and I love to tell the children when we're doing programs like this, as a matter of fact, this has been one of our most popular programs this year to do, this changing land, changing wildlife, and um, we like to say, you know, look out the window. Wouldn't it be interesting to see a whole flock or herd or whatever you call dinosaurs wandering through? Um, they weren't big dinosaurs, and the, the, you can tell by the size, there's the quarter there. Um, they didn't actually drop the quarter. That's just there for scale. Um, so, you know, but let's get more recent. 12,000 years ago, Connecticut looked like this. This was not last winter. Um, although last winter felt pretty cold. Um, the snow did vanish, but this was during the Ice Ages. And the most amazing thing about the Ice Ages is we've had at least four. The scientists don't know why they happen, and they don't know why they go away. And we are between Ice Ages at the moment, um, and it's a relatively benign period between the Ice Ages, but maybe they'll come again. We don't know because we don't know what caused them and we don't know what made them go away. But the scientists are beginning to think that when they did, uh, when the ice ages retreated, um, they melted rather quickly. There's a lot of science that there was a lot of water. Um, it takes a lot of energy to melt the ice. So that's, it takes a long time to melt ice. It just takes so much heat. Um, but when they melted, they did leave things behind. And as every gardener knows, when you dig a hole in Simsbury, although I think I was the only one in Simsbury, I was really hoping to find some of these. I wanted to build a stone wall, and mm -hmm. when we dug in our yard, there were no stones. So, <laughs> please, you know, it's just, it's one of those resources in the wrong places, you know, I'd, you know, I look longingly at other people's rocks and think, oh, if only I had some. Um, I know, but um, someone um, was digging, I think, in the hillstead, in Farmington and came across mastodon bones. Mm -hmm. How wonderful um, that we had these creatures. And what a lovely creature they were. I mean, they were not as quite as big as the elephants, but they, um, they were wonderfully adapted for this area. They were furry um, and could really withstand a lot of cold temperatures. But we don't know why they went away, any more than we know why these ones went away. The giant 500-pound beavers that lived here <laughs> during the, in between the Ice Ages um, you know, about the size of a large black bear. 
How wonderful. I, I don't think these Ice Age animals get nearly the respect that they deserve. Everyone talks about the dinosaurs, but these guys, you know, the mastodons uh, that were really only 12,000 years ago, the last one died, so it's really not that long ago. Um, that one behind? That, that would be either a woolly, that might be a woolly mammoth. Yeah. I think it was the last woolly mammoth that died about 12,000 years ago. They were still up in Siberia, and they're still uncovering them um, in, in you know, certain areas that melt, and they still find um, mammoth meat that's still edible. I mean, 100 years ago, people were still finding mammoth meat and eating it. Um, so we're going to get really recent. A thousand years ago, um, you would find that Connecticut was forested. Connecticut was probably very much like what we have now. Um, and I don't know if how many of you have ever been up to Petersham, Massachusetts to see the Harvard Forest Museum. This happens to be a picture of one of the dioramas that they have up there. That is well worth a trip. They have all these dioramas were built in the 1930s um, under a, um, you know, the WPA when they were hiring artists to do things. And these, each of these trees, that's not a painting, those were models of trees that were made with copper wires and bent and twisted, and they are exquisite. It's just so far out in the middle of... What town? Petersham, Massachusetts, which is the middle of nowhere, um, except this is the best thing out there, and it's, they're wonderfully preserved. But the, the, what, the creature who was really changing our landscape, who has changed our landscape for some time, not the 500-pound beaver, but more of the 55-pound beaver variety that we have around here. Um, these beavers um, have wonderful instincts um, to change the land, and they do so mainly with those teeth. Those never, the teeth that never stop growing, and of course their instinct is to chop down trees. The, mm. the main, you know, and here they do it so effectively. Um, it's amazing how many trees one beaver can chop down. Of course they do that to change the landscape so that they can get around more easily. They are fantastic swimmers, lousy climbers, and not very good walkers. So they, they are, they can escape their 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 predators much more easily in a water environment. They're they're powerful swimmers, they can stay underwater for quite some time. When they, when they make the dam, and do you know how beavers know where to make the dam? It's the sound of running water. It drives them nuts. Um, there, was a, there was a scientist who put a tape recorder into the woods and it had the sound of running water. It wasn't near the water, but it was in an area where there were beavers. And they left it playing overnight, and the next day they came back and found that the tape recorder was completely buried by mud and sticks. They, the beavers were trying to silence that noise. They knew wherever they sound, the sound of running water, wherever it's loudest, usually means that the river is the narrowest, and that's where they build their dam. So, clever little things. So when they build their dam, this area used to be a forest. And all those trees were happy above ground, I mean above, you know, above water. And when the beaver flooded the area, those trees died. We'll talk about them in a minute. But they changed the habitat behind the dam. So here is a little stream without beavers. It's pretty straightforward. You have a little wet area right next to the, to the stream, and the stream is flowing through. There are certain animals that like a stream environment, and some will live next to, the, next to the stream. But when beavers dam that same stream, they create a whole, series, a, a whole new set of habitats. So you have pond, you have a little bit of stream, you have wet forest, which are the riparian forests, you have swamps and marshes, and, and dry meadows, you have a whole uh, mosaic of habitats, and different animals can live there. Um, you know, the marshes are areas where you have uh, soft vegetation, you know, the grassy vegetation, and the swamps are where you have the woody vegetation, and different animals like these different habitats. So here you have the beaver, and he's bringing lunch back home. He's take, collected, I love the fact he's able to collect so many branches in his mouth, and he's, he's taking it back to eat it in the privacy of his own den um, or lodge. He will eat bark off the trees. Beavers don't eat wood. And then, like all animals that eat, they create scat. Now that scat, in which in this case looked like little sawdust pellets, that scat's going to end up back into the lake. That is going to provide nutrients for the plants that grow in the lake. So he's enriching, he's taking some of the vegetation from the surrounding area, bringing it into the pond to enrich that pond. That will then in turn, those plants will then in turn provide food for the various insects that live in the pond, which will then also provide food for other insects, which will then provide food for the creatures who live in the pond, such as the frogs and the, 
and the, um, the salamanders and the turtles, which will in turn provide food for things like the mink that will come to the beaver pond. So a wonderful food chain develops there. The sticks that the beaver brings in to create their lodge provide lovely hiding place for the smaller fry, the fish, the minnows, um, so they can keep them away from the bigger fish that would like to eat them and some of the other animals that would like to eat them. So it's a nice shelter for a sort of nursery for the fish. Those trees that were drowned when the, when the pond was created then die and are decomposed by insects and which are then a, um, excavated by the woodpeckers, those old trees then become very important nesting areas for a lot of the birds. Like the great blue heron, they will nest on the top of a tree that's in the middle of the pond and they, it makes a nice safe little moat around the tree so the raccoons won't come and climb the tree and eat their young. And the wood ducks will use the old excavated holes that the woodpeckers have created to raise their young. And uh, so these old dead trees are an incredibly vital part of that, that a beaver habitat. And when the beavers chop down the trees, some of the trees respond by re-sprouting. Um, and there are many animals that can't eat the tree, but they can eat the sprout. And in the wintertime, things like moose and deer um, really rely on those branches of either the shrubs or the re-sprouting trees to get through the winter. That's what they'll eat in the wintertime. So the, the beavers will maintain that dam as long as they have food in the area. Once they've eaten up everything that they want to eat, they will leave and that dam will break and then the water will drain out leaving a big muddy mess behind and eventually seeds will blow into it or the birds will fly and you know and drop seeds into it uh, by accident and then the new, cy new the cycle begins again because it then becomes a beaver meadow lots of bushes will grow up and trees will then grow up out of that and eventually that little beaver will come back to a forested area another beaver family years down the line will come back and say you know this looks like a really good place to build my dam so they are always changing. These beaver meadows are very favorite places for a lot of insects and a lot of birds. So it's creating a diversity of ages within, of age stands um, within the forested area, which is really important for the health of the, the forest and it's also important for the diversity of wildlife. So they, these little pockets of of animals that like the marsh or the thickets or the older forest, they can move around as the forest changes because that's the one thing you can count on is change. Here's another creature who changed the land, the Native Americans who lived here for at least 10,000 years. Um, they lived on the land and, and, and they were called the Native Americans of the Eastern Woodlands. Um, when we think of woodlands, this is what we tend to think of. And of course right now with all the beautiful fall colors, um, but that might not be how the native, the most, a lot of the woodlands were at the time the Native Americans. The Native Americans did not want to be caught up in a forest fire. Um, that, was, that was a huge fear. So they did not want this uh, conflagration up top. So what they did is they fought fire with fire. They would set fire to the woods at certain times of the year to clear out the underbrush, to clear off the extra fuel that was there, and to clear off the small trees, the vines, the problematic insects that might, might uh, aggravate them, clear off the poison ivy. Um, and they knew exactly the right time of the year and the frequency with which they should burn the forest so that their forest would look like this. And the early, early Europeans when they came, the very earliest set of the Europeans when they came, they said, you know, it, Connecticut is just like a big park. You could ride your, your carriage through the woodlands. Well, you look at our woodlands now and you know you could not drive much of anything through, let alone walk through our woods. And the goal behind burning the woods was to create this open sort of habitat. The early Europeans said you could walk from one end of Connecticut under a canopy of trees. But it wasn't like our canopy of trees. It was larger trees, um, big trees. Um, the bigger trees like the oak and the chestnut um, had a very thick bark. So when the little fires came through, they were protected by their bark from that fire. And then what the, the Native Americans were doing was selecting for those nut trees because they ate the nuts from the, the acorns and, the, and you've all gone out and gathered your, it's a good year for acorns, you've gone out and gathered your acorns? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> You, the hickory nuts? The, and, well, the hickory nuts aren't you know, a lot of work, but the acorns, the reason you haven't is because they taste terrible. But they knew how to cook them, they knew how to make them so that they were palatable, 
Um, there were grasses available for some of the animals, like the deer, to, to browse on. Um, there was a good nut crop. And you could see your enemies coming. You could see the, the animals you wanted to hunt. Berry bushes would grow up quickly after the fire. So it was more, it, we, they used the woods differently than we do. We tend to think of them as lovely places to go for a walk. Um, but they looked at them as a food source, not only for the animals they hunted, but for the foods that were grown after the fire went through. Um, and of course, those, those, those um, nuts were extremely important for keeping the animals going through the winter. Bear will eat the acorns to fatten up for the winter. Deer will also do the same. They'll eat them, they'll paw through the snow to see if they can find any acorns. And the all same thing with the turkeys. These were all animals that the Native Americans depended on to get through the winter. So very important, and um, that, and you've seen this year, it's been a really bumper crop for acorns. Well, the last couple of years, there's hardly been any. And um, the squirrel population, I know in the woods at the Nature Center, are, are few and far between. Uh, what used to be, a, you know, you, you could walk 10 feet, you couldn't walk 10 feet without seeing a squirrel. And now that there are very few squirrels, it's really the oak trees that control how many squirrels. Because the oak trees do not make the same number of nuts each year. Some years they'll make a lot, and then it's exhausting. So the next year they'll have used up all their energy, they won't make any. And then the squirrel population and the deer population, the bear population, will, will decrease. So it's really the plants. The Native Americans would grow um, their crops mainly on the bottom land near the rivers. They would build their houses out of the materials that were available in the eastern woodlands. But then along came, in 60, about 400 years ago, came the Europeans. And they came here in search of all sorts of things. But the main thing they came here for, which we don't tend to think about, is beavers. They had hunted all the beavers in Europe they wanted our beavers. And these beavers were very important for making hats. Beavers have a wonderful waterproof fur. So what they would do with the beaver felts, they'd take off the guard hair, the shiny ones, and they'd use that under mat fur, which is really dense. They'd shave that off and then take that fur and make it into felt. They'd make these felt hats. Not just these hats, but these hats as well. Anybody who was anybody had a felt beaver hat. And they were waterproof. You think about how people got along, you know, travel in that age, they were riding horses. You've never seen anyone with a horse and an umbrella. It doesn't work. You want your hands for the reins, you, you know, so you needed a really good waterproof hat. Well, there were a lot of people in Europe that needed hats, and the beavers were extirpated from Connecticut. That doesn't mean they became extinct. It means that there were no more beavers in Connecticut, no more beavers in New England, no more beavers in the Midwest, no more beavers out west. All, the only beavers left were a, few, a small population up in Canada, northern Canada, that didn't get trapped. You had a lot of the Native Americans selling these pelts to get the, the European goods. Um, so it was a tough time for beavers. Um, and here's the, fish, the museum in the Harvard Forest in Petersham, Massachusetts. This is another one of the dioramas. After the beavers were gone, then people said, you know, well, it might be good to farm here. Um, so they moved here because the land was available. And they, you know, first off, the Europeans took the land f that the, the Native Americans had farmed. All the towns like Greenfield, Enfield, Farmington, um, um, all of those things with a field in it, in it or some sort of farming reference usually means that those were old Native American farming villages. And of course, when the Europeans came, they accidentally brought diseases which decimated the population of the, Euro of the Native Americans. So the land was available. That was the easiest land to farm. And then later on, they had to start moving into the woods. By this time, the Native Americans weren't setting fire to the woods when the second wave of, of colonists came over, because trees grow really quickly in Connecticut. So the, the next batch of Europeans were not saying, this is a wonderful open forest that we can ride our horses through. Instead, they were saying, this is an impenetrable forest. I don't know how anyone lives here. We have to chop down these trees. And it took a lot of work. And here they're, they're digging up all those stones that they found in the ground that were left behind by the glaciers. Those are what they used to make the stone walls. Because when their plows hit them, it was a clunk. And they had to pitch them over to the side. And they made their stone walls. And then, so they were, they were eking out an existence, but what really cleared the forest from Connecticut was the defeat of Napoleon and the Battle of Waterloo. And I love this connection of things far away having a direct impact here. The French had the um, sort of the proprietary 
um, control over the merino sheep. Merino sheep were built, were, were bred, they had lovely long stable wool. It was the best sheep of all. And the French did not want to export their sheep. They wanted to keep tight controls on the, on the, on the merino sheep. But when Napoleon was defeated in 1815 at the Battle of Waterloo, they, everything sort of fell apart and people rushed in, got the merino sheep and brought them back to England and they brought them back to um, North America, to New England. And the, the, this was just the right place for sheep and the forests were cleared from all sorts of land. If you go up into northern Vermont and you walk through the woods of northern Vermont, you will find stone walls everywhere. People were, were raising these sheep so that they could then send the wool down to the woolen mills that were starting to be, be formed um, a few years later. So by about 1830, Connecticut was was mostly farmland. There was a fellow, Jedediah Morse, who walked through Connecticut, I think in the 1830s, and he said you could walk from one end of Connecticut to the other, and it was like a cultivated garden, a well-cultivated garden. Well, I'm sure he's exaggerating a little bit, but it was mostly farmland, and we only had 20% forest. It's kind of hard to imagine how little forest there was. Of course, that would have great impact on creatures like the turkey, which used to be sold for a penny a piece down in Hartford um, in the 1700s. There were no more turkeys. The squirrels were few and far between, the, the, and the hard, no deer, um, no bear. They were, they, were extra, they, were, they were few. Every once in a while, the farmer would leave one tree and we call it a pasture tree, or sometimes we call it a wolf tree, like a lone wolf. They would leave one tree, maybe it was used as a block and tackle um, for pulling out the other tree stumps, but it was also used um, later to um, shade the horses and cows and the sheep on a, hot, on a hot summer day here in Connecticut, so the animals didn't get heat stroke. So keep in mind this one, David. And then the animals that would be it, it would jeopardize their, their, anim, their livestock, they were removed from Connecticut. So the last wolf was hunted, I think, in Trumbull in 1850, I mean 1750, and the last mountain lion was hunted and removed, uh, killed in the state in the late 1800s. So they were extirpated. Of course, everyone was getting around by horses, and you know, horses will pull the carriages and sleigh, they pull the plow, but all horses need feed to get through the winter. You can pasture them out during the summer, but you need a lot of hay to get them through the winter. And so mo a lot of Connecticut was turned into hay field. We need an incredible amount of hay for the livestock. I mean, quite often the, the livestock were, you know, were, um, were butchered in the fall so because you needed so much hay to get them through the winter. You keep a few and then you know, you'd, you'd repopulate in the spring. But those hay fields became a wonderful habitats for a lot of birds that we just don't have anymore. Meadowlarks and bobolinks and the Vesper Sparrow used to be very, very common birds here in Connecticut. They're not now, but they were when we had so much hay field. And then this started to happen. Um, all, those, all those sheep were having all that wool led to the development of a lot of woolen mills and a lot of, a lot of factories like this one, this is Collinsville, um, this is the, um, the Collins Axe and Machete Factory. I love the fact that a lot of the axes, this was the first place that sold sharpened axe heads. Before that you could buy the axe heads but you had to sharpen them yourself. This was the first innovative thing that they made and they, then they also made a lot of the, the machetes that went on to chop down the vegetation in the Panama canal. But when these, when these things were built, a lot of dams were built along the rivers. Um, there they were a tremendous number of dams and also the factories like the tanning industry and a lot of the, you know, the hat making things, they would dump whatever was left over at the end of the day, they would just dump right into the river. So our rivers where there was a lot of industry were in terrible shape. The Park River that flowed through, through Hartford was a mess. And the Connecticut River used to be called the best landscape sewer. So in the towns that had, had um, collected sewer, they just dumped it raw into, the, into the, the rivers. And the fish were dying. And because of that, things like eagles um, were not doing well. Um, and in, in Connecticut, or uh, all up through the Connecticut River Valley, you can see the number of dams that were built in the Connecticut River Valley. Um, I think, and we have just in the Farmington River, in the section of, in the Connecticut section of the Farmington River, we have something over four, like 415 dams. 
And of course, these, these blocked the migration of the salmon as they moved upstream to lay their eggs. So they had a profound influence on um, the migration of fish, but of course, a lot of new uh, f um, industry first happened here in Connecticut. Spoonville Dam in Simsbury was the place where the first electroplated spoons were made in, in, the, in the United States. And of course, then there was also the development of, of reservoirs. We have a great reservoir system around here, but that is an impenetrable pass, you know, um, barrier to fish migration. And behind Nipog Res Reservoir, there was a wonderful little town that was um, taken over dismantled and flooded. So there are lots of interesting stories of what it might have been. By the oh, 1830s and 1860s, um, the Erie Canal opened up, the railways were opening up, and people were recognizing that there was a lot of really good land without a whole lot of rocks in it out west. So people moved west. They took the factory jobs down in the river valleys, or they moved west, and they started to abandon their farms. And by 1880, the farms in Connecticut were being abandoned left, right, front, and center. And when you take those, feed, those herbivores off the land, the cows, the horses, the sheep, they, then the forests come back, because those guys eat the young trees that are starting to grow. They just nibble them down, and the trees don't get a chance. So here's what it would look like five years after you take any of those herbivores, the cows, the sheep, um, off the land, the horses, and little trees start to grow up, little cedars start to grow up, some bushes start to grow up. Within 10 years, it looks like that. Certainly not a, you know, an area that you'd want to have cows. And within, whoops, sorry, within 20 years, it, now you have something called a thicket or a very young forest. And there's certain animals that that is their preferred habitat. Animals like the, the, uh, the New England cottontail. That's their preferred, not grassy backyards like we have now. That's, that's for the, um, the um, eastern cottontail. This is the New England cottontail, and he likes the thickets. Well, because there are rabbits there, then there are bobcats that also prefer the thickets. So now you start, you start getting a web, and there's certain birds that find that's the best place to nest. Right now, our biggest area of thickets are around our power lines. Um, because the, the power companies have to keep the trees down so it doesn't interfere with the line, so they go through every once in a while and clear that area down, and that's our biggest area of thicket in the state. Um, one of the things that also hindered our forest development for a long time was the Beckley Furnace. There was a big iron industry in the northwest part of Connecticut and also down by Roxbury, and we made the best iron for making railway carriage wheels. That was up there. And that went on until 1919. And what, um, what fueled those, those furnaces for the longest time was charcoal. And if you wander through the woods, you can often find areas where the charcoal oiling was made. The woods, the hills were cut repeatedly when the, when the trees, the thickets, were, you know, the trees were growing rather young. And then they'd make these reducing um, um, piles, these fires, to make the charcoal to fire the, the furnaces. So 30 years on, it starts looking like a woods. Um, or a forest. And this, ha yeah, I don't know if you're in your backyard, if you've ever left any area of your backyard unattended for any length of time. Within a few years, you have trees growing there quite happily that you did not plant yourself. And here, this is the, the through time, you can see what's happened to our forest cover. You can see the population is that dotted line, the New England population that starts in 1600, and think they seem to have forgotten the Native Americans that were there. Um, uh, but you can see the different states. Connecticut is the green one, which is hard to tell, but it's this line right here. You see it was one of the first ones denuded that went um, of the forest, and then it started to come back. We are now a little, we were about 60% forested, starting to change. But we went from, I think, 20 to 30% forested, but here's the main reason I think that we caught our forests back. And we don't think of these things. Cars were, were brought in as an environmental savior um, of, in the cities because all the horses, the horse manure, the dead horses, and the incredible difficulty of having to feed and stable all these horses. When cars came in, people said, oh, thank goodness, we don't have all of those problems in our cities anymore. We, we, you know, cars were a great savior. But those cars don't need hay. And horses need an incredible amount of hay. So here's what happened. In the 1900s, when we still had lots of horses, um, we had a lot of land that was set aside to grow hay. 
over time, the number of horses that we needed decreased tremendously, and the amount of land that then reverted back to forest increased dramatically. So here's a part in Pennsylvania. In the late 1900s, you can see how denuded the hills were. Trees were, were scarce. I mean, there were still trees, but not many. And now that same area is completely forested. So, and that was entirely due, they could abandon, they didn't have to have all these places upstate New York and Pennsylvania and Connecticut to feed the horses in New York City. So here we are in Connecticut, a familiar sight. And I often feel like we're little troglodytes living at the bottom of the forest. You know, sometimes we rarely see the sun in the, I know I'd take kids along the trails at the, night, at the nature center, I'm out for a half an hour, I don't see the sun hardly once when I'm out there. Um, and we still see signs of our agricultural past by seeing these old stone walls. And one of my favorite questions is to ask the children, why would anyone build this in the middle of the woods? And they'll give me all sorts of stories that this is to keep the bears out or the deer out or the, you know, this animal or that animal. Then we have to explain that oh, this used to be a farm. And here are the signs. This is an old pasture tree that stands along one of the, the, the uh, trails at the nature center. And you can see this tree used to stand and grow where no other trees were. So instead of being one of those trees that has a canopy that's you know, right above the trunk, this one spread, adu spread out. It had all the sun it wanted. It could grow by itself and get to be absolutely magnificent. But um, at one point, you know, it would know, shade the cows but it died and other trees grew up. Now that we have those oak trees, we have the animals, we support the animals that, that really like the woodlands, then we have the oak trees. So we have squirrels again. Um, but there are certain plants that we're still missing. Does anyone know this one? The chestnut, chestnut. the American chestnut. Mm -hmm. This used to be one of the most dominant trees in our woodlands. Every fourth tree was a chestnut. And then accidentally, um, the chestnut blight was brought over by gardeners. Gardeners, we, we have a lot of responsibility. Um, the plants that we choose, sometimes they behave themselves, sometimes they bring in um, diseases, and sometimes um, they just escape from our garden. Um, so that's, that's a problem. But this was a magnificent tree. It made sort of the same number of nuts every year. And there are stories that when this tree was in bloom, which blooms sometime in June, the people said the chestnut trees were so thick and the blossoms were so thick that it looked like there was snow on the mountains. I just love that story. There's some really good books about the chestnut tree. Um, and here you can see the range map. So we're in the, in the area of predominance and that's the picture of the blight that, that affected the tree. It didn't necessarily kill off the whole tree, it killed the tree above, above, you know, above ground, the roots are still there, and every once in a while the chestnut tree might, might re-sprout, but they don't usually get old enough to um, you know, mature. But here are pictures of, of the chestnut trees. The, that's, that's one chestnut, and here's another. They were, they were called the redwoods of, of the Appalachians. They were so magnificent. It was a rot resistant wood that had a lovely nut that you didn't have to boil like the Native Americans had to do with the, um, boil forever, um, like the Native Americans had to do with the acorns. You could eat it roasted, you could eat them fresh, you could eat them um, boiled. Um, it, was, it, it was one of the fastest growing trees. It was just a superb tree. And fortunately in Connecticut, the Connecticut Agricultural Research um, Station has a program to try to bring back the chestnut tree. And they're trying to cross it with the Chinese chestnut tree, which has the resistance to the chestnut blight, but it's a scrawny looking tree. So they're trying to get the resistance of the Chinese tree, but the beauty of the American chestnut tree. And there's some there are some successes um, because there's still a few chestnut trees left and they're, you know, they, um, the American Chestnut Foundation um, sends people out to find these trees and then they cross-pollinate them and um, there are plantations where they're seeing which ones are successful and probably through their work there will be, you know, the chestnut tree may be brought back to sort of like the way that the elm trees are being brought back and I think it'd be a wonderfully successful story and they're really good on, on disturbed land, and there's some possibility that in some of the, the coal mining areas where there's strip mining, um, that they would be really good for reclamation of the land there. So perhaps our grandchildren will be able to go into the forest and see, or if not plant, you know, chestnut trees um, and, and see forest, you know, 100 years from now, there may be chestnuts back in the woods again, which would be a wonderful, exciting success story. Here's the one you all know about the woolly adelgid. 
the little thing, that's the little insect, the white fuzzy thing that's been decimating some of the hemlocks. We're very fortunate the last couple of winters have been so cold that the, some of these, in many areas, the um, hel adelgid populations have been really decimated. However, the ones that survived are the cold hardy ones. And they are going to breed and they will be cold hardy generations, most of them. And that would be a shame because the, the, the hemlocks like to grow along the, sh the stream beds. They provide a nice shady area for the streams to keep the water cool in the summer and that's where the brook trout like to be. So something as tiny as a little, you know, cotton ball, little, you know, aphid insect like that can have profound effects on the flora in the, or the fauna in the, in our streams. So here's what's happening now. A lot of our trees are being chopped down again. Uh, and this is not necessarily a bad thing. Chopping, it would be a good idea to thin out some of our forests. It would be a good idea to clear cut some of our forests and allow succession to happen, to allow the thickets to grow, get meadows and get thickets so that we have a diversity of habitats. It's just that when people see the trees cut down, they get, they get very, very excited. Um, and in Connecticut, about 25% of our landscape is developed. Um, but the rest of it, the forest is pretty chopped up. Um, and here's what happens when you chop up the forest. Here's an area of houses. It was probably an old farmer's field that grew back up into trees and now it's being chopped down so we can build our houses. And it creates a lot of edge effect. And there are a lot of birds like the blue, blue jay that's doing very well because they like the edges. But then we bring in our own predators into, you know, Fluffy gets outside and Fluffy's going to be eating the birds um, that we so admire at our bird feeder. So it's sort of that we have this, this, this tension of we like to see the birds, but we like to have our cats, and, and uh, it sort of wrecks havoc with the wildlife. And then what we, how we choose to garden makes a big difference in our wildlife. The, uh, the grass that we choose um, was really only the result, those big grassy lawns were really the result of the city beautiful movement in the 1900s when everything, everyone wanted to have, you know, a nice green lawn, made your house look like a castle, like one of those English homes out in the, in the country. And um, the invention of the lawnmower meant that everyone could have grass. Before that, it, people did not have grass. So it was, you know, the 1900s, late 1800s when we, we got the first lawnmower. They were really heavy, made out of cast iron. But once all that grass came, it made it, it changed the population of this, these two species. The robin used to be a somewhat rare bird. It's now our state bird. And of course, it loves our lawns because there are lots of worms. But when we were glaciated, we didn't have any worms. Worms all came from Europe. How did the worms, I love asking the kids, how did the worms get from Europe to here? They tell me stories of how they buried, uh, burrowed under the Atlantic Ocean, <laughs> and how birds carried them in their talons across. People came with pockets full of worms, or buckets full of worms. But actually, they came in the buckets of soils where the plants were, and you know, they, they brought the plants across the ocean in these buckets of soil. When they planted them you know, in the soil, the worms escaped. So we have a lot of worms now that we never did before, and the robins will eat the worms. The Canada geese have actually been introduced into Connecticut, and now we have more Canada geese than we've ever had before. And of course, they eat grass. They're a bird that evolved up in the tundra. They eat grass. Um, they thank you very much for all this wonderful food we've put out for them, as do a lot of other animals. The raccoons, there are more raccoons now than there were before because they're quite happy living in, you know, in, with the food that we've provided. And the cardinals n were more of a southern bird. They never were here in the wintertime. They only came north because we put out bird feeders for them. And I love the fact we, you know, some of the, the, the food we put out for them is grown in Nepal or India, and we bring it across the world to feed our birds because we've ripped out the plants that feed the birds and put in plants from around the world that don't have the food that they need. So, and some of the animals have come back. In the 100 years ago, people were forming societies to protect the white-tailed deer because they were so worried that that animal would be extirpated from Connecticut as well. Um, they needn't have worried. Um, I hope they didn't have a lot of meetings because the deer have come back. We now have more deer than we've ever had because there really aren't any major predators. Um, the bear have come back. I remember at the Nature Center, um, how many of you know Jay Kaplan? Jay Kaplan, the director, who's been there for 40 years. Um, I remember when 
he used to, I, hear, I heard him answer the phone and people would say, I think I saw a bear in my yard. And this was about 20 years ago. And he said, no, probably saw a big black dog. And he told that to a lot of people until finally the DEP um, said, the Department of Environmental Protection said, no, no, we have bears in Connecticut. And he said, oh yes, we have lots of bears. <laughs> yes, you're seeing bears. And the same thing happened with bobcats. People used to call up and say, I see a bobcat. And he used to tell them, no, no, they're very shy. They don't like to be around people. They, they stay up in the thicket. And then people would bring in pictures of bobcats sunning themselves on their driveway or on their back deck. And we realized that th those animals are not reading the same books about them that we are. <laughs> um, tur turkeys came back in 1975. Uh, people realizing that we had, we had acorns, um, you know, which was a, an important crop for the uh, a food source for some of the, um, uh, for the wintering of these, these birds. I uh, went up to Maine and, you know, various places um, and bought these birds and brought them back to Connecticut and released them to see how they do. How are they doing? <laughs> doing okay? Yeah, they're, they're doing fine. And I love these pictures that show, you know, I've often noticed that the wild animals that go through my yard much prefer my brick walkway to the grass. And I love that. And I like the bird feeder, you know, the, the nice little our bird bath, uh, drinking fountain, and of course the salad bar that we plant out for the, the deer. Um, I, we have to put up signs saying, watch out for the deer. Have you ever heard the, the YouTube video of the woman who, who, who wanted to, to know why do we put up these deer signs on the busiest parts of the roadway? She was very serious. She called into a radio and said, couldn't they move it somewhere else, like to a school crossing? We're expecting things to happen as though the deer were only crossing at that sign because we put that sign up there for them. It was a great video. Um, and we have interesting encounters. You know, the deer wondering what the heck is that, and the cat's wondering what the heck is that. Um, I did have an encounter like this with my cat in my backyard, and they, they were both looking at each other with great bewilderment as to what is it. Um, but, you know, these animals are getting very used to us. You were saying earlier that, you know, you, they, they just, they're not afraid of us. The bears are not afraid of us. I mean, they're, they're, no, that we are no threat to these animals. And that's not necessarily a good thing. Here's someone feeding the deer. Not a good idea. Not a good idea. And these deer are changing the forest. They preferentially eat all their favorite foods in the forest, all their favorite trees in the forest. And so in an area where you have too many deer, and we have too many deer, they are changing the forest by eating all the young saplings, just the way the cows would have eaten the little trees in the meadow. Um, the MDC has a, a little garden um, demonstration plot where they fenced off an area of the woods to show what the woods would look like without the deer. Um, and without the deer, you have spring flowers. When we go for walks in the woods, it's hard to find spring flowers because the deer eat them. I know we just got a grant from the Cherry Brook Garden Club at the Nature Center to put up a deer exclusion fence around our wildflower garden, which the Cherry Brook Garden Club had been involved in, in helping us with. Um, but it was, you know, it was a futile thing. They would, you know, we only had the plants that the deer didn't like. And you don't preserve the things that you don't know about. So what we're trying to do is we're going to put up the deer exclusion fence, plant some things, see what's there, and show people what it could be like if we managed our deer population. And that is a very hard sell because they're adorable looking animals, but we just have so many of them. Um, so we have some hard choices ahead in how we manage the land for what, you know, what needs to be done. Um, here's one. I serve on the Simsbury Conservation Commission Inland Wetlands, and one of the things that we try to preserve are the vernal pools. Vernal means spring. These are places that fill up with water in the spring. Um, these are the breeding grounds for fascinating creatures like the wood frog. Um, the wood frog you can find all the way up to the Arctic Circle. Um, and it is a fascinating creature because it's one of the few animals that instead of hibernating the way a lot of animals will do by burying into the mud and staying in the you know, semi-warm soil, you know, 55 degree soil down under a few feet, these guys freeze solid like little frog popsicles. And then in the, well, almost solid, but they have sort of an antifreeze in there. And then in the spring, when the weather warms up, they thaw out and hop out way. Oh, no. uh, just nice. absolutely incredible. So they get a, a head start on the spring, and they will breed in these <coughs> vernal pools because these ponds are going to be dried by the summertime, and there are no fish in them which like to eat the frogs, the frog eggs, and the tadpoles. So 
the, these, these are great little places, and this is where we get our salamanders, and what these, these little creatures do is they take the food from the, the, the and they are sort of like the, the this is like these the vernal pools are like the bread basket for the the for the woods. There's so much. There's these are explosive breeders. They, so many animals come out of that pond, and then go into the woods, and then feed the other animals. Um, this is a very important species. However, as we develop our woods, you know, it's so easy to overlook these little areas because they are dry by the summer. Someone comes by and doesn't really notice them. We're trying to get better at uh, mapping these. But if someone says, oh look, it's just a little low area, we'll just fill it in. Next spring when the animals come back, there's nowhere to breed. So these, these are somewhat vulnerable areas. And it's also, I always find it very sad when I'm going to a meeting of the Conservation Commission Inland Wetlands on a rainy spring night. Mm -hmm because that's when the frogs are out on the road. I can think, well, you know, if only we couldn't meet in the spring when, we, when these things, if everyone could just stay home for a couple of days when it rains, um, these things could get across the road. Actually, in some places, they put up signs and salamander crossings and, you know, in, the, in certain areas, you know where they're going to cross and try to protect them so at least they can get to their breeding ground. But they also have to be, have uplands. The wood frogs don't live in the ponds, they live uplands. So if you have a mowed lawn, that's not a habitat for them. So if you have the vernal pool nicely protected and then everything else is mowed lawn, they're still not going to make it. And of course, all our roads, that's not, that's not good. Um, that turtle is going to have a tough time getting across that road successfully. We used to have lots of box turtles in, in this area. We don't have many now. They don't lay many eggs, so there's, you know, we have the loss of habitat, we have the roads, and we also have children going into the woods and finding little turtles and saying, hey, isn't this cute? I'm taking them home and taking them out of the breeding population. Then so, these guys, unlike the snapping turtles, which are doing just fine, thank you very much, they will lay 40 eggs, uh, 40, 50 eggs. These guys will only lay five. So, um, and in Connecticut, I mean, this needs to be updated, but this is the last one I think the DEEP put out um, as a brochure. We have 600 listed species. Now, some of them are plants, um, some of them are insects, um, but we have lots of birds and lots of animals that um, are either endangered, threatened, or species of special concern. Most of them are grassland, thicket, or water, uh, wetland species. We don't have that many woodland species that are endangered, although some of them, you know, their populations fluctuate. But it's really these lost habitats we have. We don't have many grasslands. We don't have many thickets. Um, we need more of a mosaic. We have trees that are always sort of of the same age. We have young, mature forest. And it's pretty much across the state we have young, mature forest. And that's not particularly healthy. Um, we need to sort of develop, find ways of, of, of making those grasslands. One of the ways is um, low impact development. Um, and it's not low impact development it doesn't mean everything has to be clustered. It usually means that you have to set aside some other land for another land use. So in the traditional development, it doesn't really work. I mean, everyone's got their grass, but nothing, re grass is sort of a biological desert. What you need are some, some areas where you can set aside and have a meadow or a thicket. Um, and there's some uh, interesting ways that we should be demanding our towns to develop um, so that we can maintain um, corridors for animals to, to move around the landscape, um, not necessarily through our backyard. Um, one of the biggest problems you all know is, is the invasive species. Um, I serve on the Sims Bay Land Trust and the, um, I know at Rowing Brook Nature Center. We have, um, from time to time, we're fortunate to get community service people. These are court ordered community service people, and the court ordered community service people often get the task at the Nature Center of pulling out all the plants that we've planted in our yard and have escaped into our forest, and we spend a lot of time pulling them out. My pet peeve right this time of the year is the winged duonimus, the burning bush. Um, you, you are now starting to see it. It's starting to come into its own. I have, I have my, um, my own sort of slogan. I think we should, you know, take these things out of our yard. I'd like to suggest a campaign slogan, sort of better dead than red in, in your <laughs> yard, or get the red out. Um, we should take these plants out because they are spreading. I mean, maybe the barn, you know, the horse has already escaped from the, you know, the barn, we're closing the door after it. But um, it, it's one of those, once you start thinking about these plants escaping from our gardens, you know, you feel a responsibility. I know I planted some of these things because Audubon told us that that would be a really good thing to plant. And I look at these things and I feel guilty. But it's, it's costing a lot of money to get these out of areas. But it's not all gloom and doom. There are successes. The eagles have come back. 
Um, the beavers were brought back in the 1900s. Someone said, well, look, we got trees, and why don't we bring the beavers back? Beavers are doing very well in Connecticut. And the bluebirds are doing well because we put up the bluebird boxes. Um, Fisher cats, that's exciting. We have them. But you know, we need those predators. We need those predators as horrible as, as it seems. We had an owl. Um, the, um, we didn't know we had fishers in the area at the Nature Center. Like, you know, we're supposed to know these things. Um, and they chewed through one of our cages and ate one of our you know, captive owls. Um, that was a wake up call. Oh, look, we have fisher. We were looking at the tracks and saying, what the heck is that? Looks like a weasel family. Well, it was a fisher cat, if we'd known. I had a moose in my backyard. I live in Simsbury, on, near Old Farms Road. It only came through once. We don't have a lot of moose, but we have, up in the northwest corner, there is some moose. Um, so they're here. Um, some animals are new, like this possum. They've been, you know, in the 1930s, we didn't have any possums in Connecticut. They've been moving up from the south, um, expanding their range, mainly because the food's here. Uh, but they're not well adapted to winter. Their ears are bare, their toes are bare, and their tails bare. So they often get frostbite in our cold winters. And here's one who has replaced the wolf. These guys came over from the west. They moved up sort of up into Ontario, and then came back down. Um, south into, into New England. Um, and, you know, it's fun standing in my backyard listening to the coyotes howl. Um, it was really quite, um, you know, I first moved here, it wasn't a problem for my cats. It's a problem now. Um, my cats are indoor cats um, because of these guys. And that's for the best, it's for them, and it's, it's also, eh. these guys, there's just so many of them. And they're getting bolder because we're not, th we're not a threat. Everyone's probably heard someone who said, I think I saw a mountain lion. And some of the people, I know a vet who said, you know, I, I know, I saw a mountain lion, it wasn't a bobcat. Um, they could be coming back. I mean, if one can come from South Dakota and make its way over here, I don't know what's stopping the other ones from coming. There's certainly habitat, there's food here for them, the, the, um, the, um, the deer. And wolves can easily come down from the Adirondack, from the Algonquin Park up in, up in Ontario. There's a nice corridor through the um, Algonqu um, Adirondacks, and they could easily make it down here. Eventually, these things, I think, will come. Whether people say, you know, they're already here, I don't know. Officially, DEEP, you know, Department of Environmental Protection, says they're not here, but I think they could be. Um, what terrifies me is the thought of these things coming. These guys, these wild boars, are already up in Syracuse. Um, yes, and I, I, I like to think that I've been leading children through the Nature Center trails during the best of times because I'd hate to tell the children, now listen children, I want you to stay with me because there could be mountain lions or wild boars <laughs> or wolves. I, mean, <laughs> I can see that instead of having this long string of kids behind me, they'd be all walking with me <laughs> at the same time. Um, and of course, some of the things aren't big and scary. They're terrifying in this shape. We have an invasion of the emerald ash borer, and then here's something, the sudden oak death, the remoran blight, um, affecting the oak trees. Imagine what would happen to our animal populations if we didn't have the oak trees. That would be absolutely devastating. And here's that horrible one, the Asian longhorn beetle. And look at the number of trees. That, some, some species are very specific as to what, what tree it attacks, like the chestnut blight, will only attack chestnuts. This will, will drill holes through everything. Here is a terrifying story. Um, this is um, Worcester, Massachusetts. They found the longhorn beetle. It comes in like, you know, packing materials from, you know, other countries, um, usually Asia, um, and they found it. And so they had to, and to save the, the woodlands of New England, they had, to des they had to chop down all of those trees that it could be possibly in. And, um, and there's strict rules about, this is one of the reasons why you don't transport firewood from one place to another. Um, this is what it looks like now. They could keep the, the evergreens, but that's what, the, what's what it looks like. And this, they had to expand the range. It was something like a 25 mile radius at first, and now it's even bigger. So this, imagine if it got out into our, our woodlands. I mean, not only would it devastate, you know, it would devastate the trees, it would devastate the habitat, you know, um, there'd be incredible risk for forest fires because of the accumulated, you know, the dead the thing. But speaking of, of devastation, 
we you know, had a huge hurricane come up through Connecticut, Massachusetts in 1938. It devastated the, the forest in 1938. We lost so many um, board feet of, of lumber um, and woods, uh, and it took a long time to recover. And that's really what the Petersham, Massachusetts um, forest exhibit was really showing that the history of the woods, of the forest from the 1,000 years ago till 1938, which is when they, when they stopped. Um, but this, uh, you know, we just dodged a bullet in um, a couple of weeks ago. Hurricane Joaquim, which was huge, if it, you know, if some of the weather configures, I know some of the weather people were just absolutely beside themselves because it was so hard to predict where it was going to go. But if one of the high ridges had just been slightly off, this thing would have come up to Connecticut, and we would have been hit. Um, and this has nothing to do with, you know, suppose climate change or anything like that. These things happen. We have extreme weather events. Um, I'm not a big proponent of, of climate change because I know what our weather used to be like and I know that we've always had extreme weather. And looking at a weather event and say it's some big change, I don't know. Our records are too short to really say. But look at these storms. They come up. They come up and we, we tend to forget about them. Some of these were absolutely enormous storms. So we don't get them often, but when they come, and if we have all these young mature forests, we are going to see change. And that's, that's the big thing. We just don't know what's coming next. But one thing we can count on is that there will be change. Um, if we find uh, uh, you know, longhorn beetles here, this area would be devastated. We'd have a whole new regime. You know, and as a result, we'd have new animals. Because the base of the food chain is plants. And not any plant will do. You have to have the right plants in order to have the animals that you want. And we're really lucky that we have such a diversity of plants in our area because of a whole set of circumstances that happened in the past to make it what we have now. But we can tell that in the forest in the future, if we have forests, we'll be completely different than the forests we have now. And this is the time in which we need to make our decisions. And sometimes the decisions happen in our own backyard by the plants we choose and the decisions we make in our own backyard have profound impacts on our, on our forest and on the health of the ecosystem. And so we're all part of this, we're all part of that question mark, seeing what's going to go off into the future and what, or what we'll leave for our grandchildren. So it's a fascinating time, but change is the only thing we can count on. So thank you. You've been a most attentive audience. And thank you for having me here today. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.